Okay, so maybe you've seen this before. Uh, Veritas has a great video on this. Uh, this is the Dana Beckhoff effect. I might not be saying that correctly, but that's fine. Uh, so the idea is you have this handle, and this is in the space station so that you can really see the effect. And it's spinning, and when it spins, it flips back and forth, and it's really kind of cool. And uh, you can make an explanation of this um, based on the moment of inertia tensor and all that stuff. But I want to make a different explanation. So let me let me start off with this demonstration. This is uh, my daughter, and this is a while ago we made this video. And, and when you think about angular momentum, this is the classic example of angular momentum. So I'm going to spin her on this rotating platform, and then she's going to pull her arms in and change her moment of inertia, and that changes her angular velocity. So this is a great example of conservation of angular momentum. And I'm going to show you angular momentum in just a second, but I want to show you this video. Now, here's another complicated video. This is something that you can do also, and this is related to the effect. If I toss this eraser up into the air, uh, the angular momentum is constant, and I'll show you why, but the angular velocity is not constant. You'll notice how that eraser isn't just spinning in one axis, it's, it's the axis of rotation actually spins. And so how does that all work? And so I, what I wanna do is build a model of this spinning, flipping T-handle uh, but I, I want to do it without angular momentum. That's my goal. Can I do this without angular And yes, I can do it without angular momentum. Okay, so let's just talk about uh, momentum and angular momentum for a second, uh, <clears throat> just to make sure that we're all on the same page here. First of all, we have momentum. Momentum is defined as mass times velocity if it's not moving near the speed of light. Uh, and we have the momentum principle. I'll write this in... Uh, finite element form, the net force on an object is the change in momentum with respect to time. So it's delta P over delta T. And I'm going to use this principle to model that spinning handle. Okay, now we also have another way of thinking about the motion of a rigid object, and that's with angular momentum. So I could say this. I could define angular momentum for a rigid object as L equals I omega, where L is the angular momentum, I is what we call the moment of inertia, and omega is the angular velocity vector. And so in this form right here, it looks like L and omega have to be in the same direction. And that's sometimes true, okay? That's sometimes true if we, if we fix the axis of rotation. So this is what you see in introductory physics courses, where I is a scalar value, and you can calculate I as, um, for finite elements, the sum of mi ri squared, and that's just the mass of each element times its distance from the axis of rotation squared, and you add them all up and you get, the moment, you get a scalar moment of inertia, that's a scalar value. But in fact, if you let the object rotate freely, then I is actually a tensor that looks like this, Ixx, Ixy, Ixz, Iyx, Iyy, Iyz, Izx, Izy, Izz. So all these elements you have to find, and they uh, depend on the orientation of the masses with respect to some fixed point, not an axis. And in that case, if this is a tensor, it is indeed possible for when you multiply this, these two uh, vector omega and the, operate the tensor on it, you can get angular momentum in a different direction. Okay, So that's what makes this, this flipping T-handle problem really difficult, is that that does indeed exist. But I don't want to do that. I want to do this as a momentum problem. And I can, and I did, and I will, and I did. Okay, so here is what I'm gonna do. So here I have, this is an actual rigid object of a T-handle, like that. I don't want to model this with momentum because if I do, it's really hard to explain the, the rotation of a rigid object uh, without angular momentum, and in fact you can't. But, in most cases, angular momentum can be reproduced with just normal momentum. So I'm going to replace this object with one that looks like this. Just three masses. 
And if I calculate the force on each mass, then I can find its updated momentum. And if I update the momentum, I can find its updated position. And position and momentum are vectors, so I can get this thing to behave just like a spinning T-handle, but how do I do that? It's not rigid. And in fact, what I'm gonna do is have these masses connected by springs. So let's call this M1, M2, M3. And so there can be some origin over here, and this is uh, R1, this is R2, this is R, well, I missed it, R3. They all have vector positions of those things. And if I calculate all the forces on mass one, I can say F net one is the change in momentum for one with respect to time. And that's gonna be equal to, I should have called it something else, but let's say that's P1, two minus P11. One, one. So this is the momentum at the end of the time interval. This is the momentum at the beginning of the time interval. And I can divide that by delta T. Now I, I multiply both sides by delta T and I get uh, P12, and I'll solve for P12, is P11 one, one plus F net one delta T. So if I, if I, if I break this into a small time interval, such that I can assume that the net force is constant, which it's totally not, okay? Because if you, if you imagine these things moving around, these forces are not gonna be constant because these are springs. I'm gonna show you the spring force in just a second. But if I assume that it's constant, then I can take the momentum of, at the beginning of the time interval and find the momentum at the end of the time interval. Then I can do the same thing using this. V average is approximately equal to P12 over M which is delta R2 over delta T. This is the change in position with respect to time. And I can use that to find the new position of R, that's actually delta R1, sorry. Delta R1 with respect to time, that's object one. So then I can solve for R12 at the end of the time interval. R12 is R11 plus P12 over M delta t. So this is really important. If I can calculate the force, I can update the momentum, update the position, and do it all again, and do that for each one of these three masses. And that's a lot of work for a human, but not for a computer. Okay, now, so now I just need to find this force right here. Okay, so what I'm going to do is to say, let's take uh, this length, I'll call this L12. It's the unstretched length of that. I can calculate the force uh, I need to calculate the force. I'm using bad, bad symbols here. Let's just for now call this R. I'm gonna call this the vector R. Uh, if I know the vector R from two to one, I can say F two to one is gonna be negative K, where that's the spring constant. Uh, then I'm gonna have the magnitude of R minus L one two times R hat. So this will give me the uh, amount that it's either stretched or compressed, I'll multiply by a unit vector in that direction and get a force. And that will give me this, this compression or stretching force for this spring right here. Then I just need to do it for the other three springs. So each mass is gonna have two forces acting on it. And all these masses are gonna change uh, with respect to time. And so I can, but I can calculate all those forces. And so that's no big deal, right? And then I just need to pick a value for the masses, pick a value for the springs, and be done with it. But is that actually gonna make the whole thing rotate? Well, I need to actually start it off rotating, and here's a little trick. Suppose I want to make this three mass system rotate with some angular velocity. Okay, so let's, let's pick the center of mass for this three mass object, and I'm gonna make it a little bit bigger. Let's say this is the center mass right there. I can calculate uh, vector R1, R2, and R3. I want to find the velocities of these three such that they will have a constant angular velocity for the whole thing. They all, I want them to all have the same angular velocity. So let's say it's rotating like this. So I need to find V1, V2, V3. Well, I can use this expression. Vi is gonna be equal to omega cross Ri. 
So if I know the angular velocity vector and I know the ri, I can find this with the cross product. So if you look right here, r2, if I say omega is actually going into the board, into the thing, then r2, or omega cross r2, would give me that direction v2 and I can find the velocity. And so if I do that, and if I set all these velocities initially at some value, then I can make it uh, start off rotating in some particular way. And then I, once I do that, I can calculate uh, the, the three four, all the forces on that and update the positions and get it all to work. Okay. Um, so now I'm going to show you that code. I'm not going to write the code. A lot of times I write the code, but I'm going to actually show you the code uh, that I have, and I want to show you how I can check if it is indeed true. Uh, if this is working the way I would expect it, a free rotating object with no gravitational forces, then the angular momentum should be constant. And instead of calculating the moment of inertia as a tensor, which you can even easily do, okay, and you can you can do it that way. It's not too hard with three masses. I actually want to do this. I want to say the angular momentum for one piece, Li, is going to be Ri cross Pi. So I can calculate the angular momentum for each of these and then add those together and find the total angular momentum and then plot that, right? I can plot the total angular momentum. It should be constant, and we can see if it's constant. Okay, I know that's a lot of stuff, but I want to jump over here and show you this, and then and rotating in this fashion, and show you the code for that. Uh, let me get this up right here. Uh, code, there it is. Switching to Python. And I will give you the code down below. Okay, so let's just go over some of the parts of this code. Let me make this a little bit bigger. Everyone likes it bigger, bigger, okay. Uh, so this first stuff up here, uh, this is just setting up the graphs. Uh, <clears throat> this is, these are just parameters for the, the dimension. So I did make it such that uh, the links aren't all the same just for fun. The masses aren't all the same just for fun. Uh, this is the initial angular velocity. So in this case, uh, the Z axis is out of the page. Right, so it's going to be rotating in the z in the positive z, z direction. That seems it should be. Oh no, that's right. So it's rotating this way. That's what I have. Um, then here, k is the spring constant um, for all those things, and this is the initial center of mass right there. Uh, I think, I think I calculated that. Uh, then I make these three masses: mass A, mass B. See, you notice I switched from mass. 1, 2, and 3 to A, B, and C, which is a better thing to do, but I wasn't thinking very, very smart. So I calculate the, uh, the vector position res with respect to the center of mass, and then I give it a radius, a color, and a trail, and the mass. The velocity I calculate with that cross product. Cross product is built into Python, so that's what this does right here. It calculates the, velo the initial velocity of the thing, and I can use that to find the initial momentum of each mass. They all have different initial momentums. Um, so that just sets up all of those, uh, and down here I calculate RAB is the vector from A to B, BC is from B to C, CA, C to A, and those are my three springs. Uh, and then I create the three springs as sticks, they're cylinders. Uh, I calculate the length of the three um, springs, and I set L0, that's the unstretched length? I'm not sure what that is. I don't think I use that. Do I? Okay, so here is where I, I'm gonna rotate this for three seconds. I calculate the three vectors. Again, I need to do that because I need that for the forces. And then I, uh, this LAB is the unstretched length. So I don't know what that L0 is, right? Those are the ones that don't change. So there's my equation for the spring force. It's just what I had before. Uh, so I calculate the three spring forces. I use that to update the, the momentums of each three. And you'll notice that each mass has two springs acting on it. And so you got to think about, you got to be careful which spring is in the right direction and which is in the wrong direction. Because if I look at the force from A to B, it's the opposite of, of B to A. Okay, so, so I don't have to recalculate everything. So some of these are minus and some are pluses. You definitely need to be careful. And I did this all manually. You could probably do it uh, automatically, but I'll, I'll do that later. So these calculate the, the distances, calculate the forces, update the momentums, update the positions. Uh, and then I, re, I, I updated the visual part of the springs 
uh, right here. That's just, that's just moving those springs. Uh, and this calculates the angular momentum of each mass. And then I update time and then I plot it. Okay, so let's run this and see what happens. So there you see that th there is a little bit of wiggle you'll notice in there because they are springs, right? So if I, and you, it is important to have them start with the, the proper initial velocities uh, with the proper stretch. And I don't think I actually had them properly stretched. Uh, so they actually stretch a little bit and wiggle back and forth, which I'm fine with, right? It kind of looks cool and it shows us authentic. Uh, and you can see that it does do what we expect. It stays rotating. Uh, nothing is magic about that. If I go down here uh, to the plot of angular momentum, uh, this is the angular momentum of the, this is the, I'm just plotting the, what am I plotting, the Z component? Yeah, this is, this is the Z component of angular momentum for the three masses, uh, A, B, and C are these three things right here. And you'll notice they wiggle, right? Because the masses are wiggling. Uh, and so the velocities and the momentum change because they're wiggling. But when you add all these together, look at this. The total angular momentum is constant. And I think that's kind of awesome. Uh, you, know, you can say the total momentum is constant. That's pretty easy to show. Uh, but that the total angular momentum is constant, that's even cooler. So, so the model works. Now all I have to do is to change the axis of rotation. And we can see if we can get the spinning flipping thing. Uh, so this is spinning about the z axis this way uh, <clears throat> i want to spin it about the x axis like that so let's just go up here and change this where's my omega there it is right here i'm going to i'm going to change this to zero and then this to three and let's see what happens so it's rotating And let's increase the time. Let's do seven seconds. Okay, so it's rotating. Uh, this is what we'd expect. You'll notice in the in the graph, you can see right down there, you get a little bit of, of jiggling, and it's not flipping. It's not flipping because if it's rotating exactly along that axis, it's, it's not going to work. It needs to be tilted a little bit off axis in order to get the handle to flip. So let's give this, um, let me see what value I used over here. Okay, I'm going to give it a slight angular velocity in the y direction also. So go up here, my y velocity, I'm going to add a point, no, not that, point 0.1. So it, now my angular velocity, the initial angular velocity vector is tilted up just a little bit. Actually, it'd look like, like this, yeah, up just a little bit. And let's run it and see what happens. I mean, I don't know. I mean, that's awesome. I don't know if you know that that's awesome, but I'm telling you that that's awesome. Uh, so it did indeed flip back and forth. And the important thing is I, I, I calculate the angular momentum, but I'm not using this as an angular momentum problem. I'm not doing a rigid object problem. I'm just calculating the angular momentum just to plot it. And let's see if that plot looks like down here. So you can see that it does indeed flip. You can actually see the flip right here. Uh, the mass C is that one on the end, but definitely things are happening. The total angular momentum right there. The total angular momentum was zero. Oh, this is the Z component, that's why. Let's change this to the, uh, the X component of angular momentum. Let's just do that. We can do that really easily. So I go down here to the plot, change all these to X's. X, X, X. You gotta say it out loud or it doesn't actually work. And I rerun it. The, the, the code looks the same, but I want to look at the graph over here. There, that's, you can see the total angular momentum up here is almost three. It's not quite three because I do have that component. And there you can see the flipped. I mean, that's pretty cool. And you can do it without angular momentum. And that's what I think is so awesome that we can build these things and show that, you know, if I have some rotating rigid object um, like this, I, I could model this as a whole bunch of individual masses and get the same thing. But this in this case, um, you know, three is not going to do it. Uh, I might be able to do this with six, uh, assuming that everything else in between is constant. 
Um, but it, it is kind of, it's not actually rigid. It does shake back and forth. This does move, but okay. So the code's down below. Uh, I'll link to my, I have a blog post about this too with more details. Um, and, and that's that. I'll talk to you later.